and I went to the local like parts department at a Volvo dealer and uh, I gave him my reg to the person behind the desk, as you do, and they were like, your car's not on the system. And I was like, yeah, it probably predates the system. So I went back out to the car, opened the bonnet, got the VIN number, gave him that, and that was still no help at all. And then, of course, there was the 100-year-old man in the back of the parts department who knows everything, who just walked out and was like, you want one of them? And that was the right thing. Um, I'm Jack, I'm 27, and this is my 1982 Volvo 244 DL, which is like about as low spec as it can get. It's proper BOGO standard, I think. The only uh, upgrade this had on it from really the lowest spec is it's got power steering, and that's about it. Everything else is BOGO on it. This is my fourth car, I think. I'd my, fir my first car I got before I could even drive, I had an old uh, MG Metro that I really, really wanted. It was in such a terrible state. I was like 15, 16 years old at the time. And then I remembered that when you want to fix a car, you need money. And I didn't have any because I didn't even have a job. When I passed my test, I had a, one a Peugeot 106, which obviously everybody loves the first car, and I thought that was the best thing ever. And I just, and that really got me like into cars, and I did all the usual bad boy racer stuff. It was terrible thinking about it now, but it was like what got me into it. And then um, I had an Astra after that, and oh god, I hated that car so bad. I don't need to talk about it. It was awful. Uh, the first Volvo I had was a uh, 96. V70, and that's what sort of started the interest in them. Was like it had the uh, 2.5 five cylinder engine, which is just a great engine, it made all the right noises and stuff like that, and it was really fun to drive for a big, for a car its size anyway. Um, and then I was like, oh, I want something rear wheel drive and a bit cooler and stuff like that, and I started looking at 740s and nine, the nine series, but they're just because they are like, as everyone says a heavy tank of a car and people run them forever and then they don't really look after them it's really hard to find one in like a nice condition and then i came across this and it's not like the best spec it hasn't got like the nicest engine and all that but it's just got not a lot of miles on it so i was like i've got to have it because it was in a really good condition i found it on a cars and classics website i was scouring for uh, 240s i really 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 wanted an estate i was i was like I don't want a saloon, I don't want a saloon, I want an estate, I've got to find one, but just finding one in decent condition, like, I've learned more now about, like, working on cars and doing body work and stuff like that, but at, at the time I wasn't in a position to start welding and cutting bits out of my car, so I needed to find one that was reasonably solid from the get-go, um, and then this popped up and it was, like two hours away from my house so I went and looked at it and I, as soon as I went and looked at it I was like yep I need it and I, I want it I put a deposit on it and then picked it up the next day it had like 50, less than 50,000 miles on it when I got it and the history to prove it it was all original like it's had little bits of paintwork here and there like but it's 36 38 years old now so obviously that's by the by but it was completely original and pretty much like untouched when I got it, it was just a really tidy example. The plan for the build initially was was nothing really, I just wanted an old car. I wasn't interested in like doing anything with it, I just wanted an older car and then it was like I'd had it for about a year and as with anything things just started to go stale and I was like oh I just wish it looked a bit cooler and I just wish it had this and had that and then you start to look at pictures of similar cars on the internet and you see other 240s and like things like that and you're like oh I could do this to mine and I could do that to mine and and then and then it just sort of spiraled from there I mean it's it's hardly crazy at the minute but it's definitely not original when I bought it it came with loads of information the first owner sold it into like the film and television industry so it's actually been in like loads of films like when they do like a, a classic film or it needs to look like it's an 80s film it's been in the backdrop in like uh, 10 or 15 films and um, the last film it was in was it, it was on I don't know if it is still but it was on Netflix it was um, a film about Scottish gangsters called The Wee Man it's like it's not 
really a film about cars, but it's the hero car, like he drives it the most in that. So it's quite cool that you can like watch a film and be like, oh, that is my car. It's like, no, it looks the same. No, that is literally my car. But it was cool because it came with a lot of history, a lot of information about it. And, and that's why it hasn't got a lot of miles because I should imagine it's just spent most of its life sat in like a, a lot somewhere waiting to be taken out and wheeled out for the next film. As daft as it sounds, not a lot, just looked at, tried to look after it. I've had to do a bit of welding on it, like in the obvious places on these, like the rear arches tend to be quite poor and the front wings are like blown a bit on the bottom here. But mechanically wise, nothing really other than like servicing. Uh, I did a full exhaust on it and made a manifold because I wanted to get into that sort of like fabrication side of stuff and making your own bits and stuff like that. And I thought that was a good place to start. It's on BC coilovers. I didn't really want to run cut springs. A lot of people do and they don't really have any issue with it, especially on these because they're big, heavy cars. So they don't really jump the springs out of the seats like they do on other things. But I didn't want to just run cut springs. I always think it's like a bit of a budget way of doing it. I'm not massively happy with how it sits at the minute. I'd like to get it lower in the rear, but there's so much involved in changing the rear suspension to get like an extra inch worth of drop. I just haven't got round to doing it yet, but it'll definitely be definitely be in there and then there's the the wheels which is um which i like the most uh, they're rays lmgt2s they took me forever to find because they're, they're not mega rare but they are quite an oddity and uh, i just like chunky five spokes i think they look really good on this body shape and i, I wanted them and i wanted them on this car i haven't done anything crazy on the inside other than just cleaning it regularly and i'm really fortunate because I don't know if it's just an old car thing, people know them with old stuff, but the, the dashes tend to split. And thankfully it hasn't in this because I would want to change it or fix it if I could, but fingers crossed yet, the dash hasn't split, so. That's what, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but the, uh, the number in the windscreen was um, the Bruntingthorpe world record attempt. Somewhere in Poland, the year or before previous, like 2017, to have the most amount of Volvos like on track at, ta at the time, at one time, and they got like 650 cars or something like that. So obviously somebody set up a thing to start a group to try and do it in the UK. And uh, on the day it was just great. There was like 2,500 cars there at this like big Bruntingthorpe. It's like a, it's like a disused airfield. So it's just like a massive oval track. But unfortunately, it, they did a really good job, but it wasn't organised that well, so we didn't get the record because they were saying that there was too many cars that weren't moving because they got that. I didn't think they expected to get as many cars as they did, so it was that busy. It was like oh, just trying to queue in a massive tra traffic jam on a, on a racetrack. It, was, um, it got interesting at some point, so I was definitely worried about somebody dinging my car, but it, but it was just really cool to be a part of it. We didn't get the record, but it was really cool to be around like more than 2,000 other people that all shared the same enthusiasm for these weird Swedish cars. The guy who originally bought this car, um, because he was a, a major in the army, uh, because he signed the, the original book for it, I could find out loads of information in it and he bought the car in like September 1982 and then died in November. So I was like, how unfortunate is that? Like you, you had it for less than two months and then I, I assume he left it to his wife, if he had a wife, I don't know, but like I could find out his information because he was in the army. I've owned it for longer than he has and he bought it, bless him, so uh, there's that. It sounds daft, but it, it wasn't special at the time. Like, it was sort of, I, I wanted I wanted a rear-wheel drive Volvo, but then just buying it, spending time like with friends going out and doing stuff, it getting quite a bit of attention and stuff like that and people being interested and meeting people because of the car you've got, that's what's made it special now. It's more special to me now because of the people I've met from having the car and the things I've done in it and the places I've been and stuff like that. It's like the memories I've made with the car now are more than just why I wanted it in the first place. Most proud of the look you get off of like I remember when I first got it and you'd ride round in it and you'd like a certain generation of people you'd like look at you in an old car and be like look at that young man in that car 
Like, he must be a really responsible young man driving an old car that's really well looked after like that. And then you put it on lows and you put it on wheels and you put a loud exhaust on it and you get the exact same person looking at you like, look at that idiot, he's ruined that car. I, what is he doing? And you just think, yeah, like you get really excited about that. And, and you, like, I'm still the same me, but you know that the, how they judge you has changed immediately just because of how the car looks and it just makes me smile every time. I don't think I've got the skills at the minute to do a massive engine swap on it, but I would like to and you know, the passion's there and, I, and I'd like to do it. What, what I'd put under the bonnet, I don't know. People have put 1UZs in them, Rover V8s, LSs obviously. Over in America, that's all they seem to drop in them because you can get them for 10 a penny. It's not as good over here for that sort of thing, but uh, literally, I mean, everyone's seen them on the internet. There isn't an engine that hasn't been under the bonnet of one of these. I've always liked the idea of um, a BMW inline six, like an M54 or whatever it is. I don't know the technical codes for it. Um, just because it's a t tidy, nice looking engine, it makes reasonable power, naturally aspirated light. I think it has about 80 brake horsepower currently, so anything from there is sort of like a huge upgrade. If you put a car engine in that made 200 brake horsepower, you're more than doubling it anyway. This was the first rear wheel drive car I ever owned, which definitely taught me a lot more about driving a car like, obviously, even the V70 I had before was quite a powerful front wheel drive car. It had like 180 brake horse. So you could really get it to like pull out and understeer on corners and stuff like that. I learned a lot about driving in that if you like, um, but it, it was all the same thing. It was like, if you're going too fast, lift off, try not to brake like an idiot in a bend and stuff like that. But swapping from a front wheel drive car to a rear wheel drive car when you'd never driven one and nobody had ever really given you any advice and then like the first day I went out in it in the wet I spun it because I was being an idiot as you are as you do um, so that opened my eyes to a lot of things but now it's like I wouldn't have anything else I just like driving a rear wheel drive car it's way much more fun there's still a lot of great driving cars that aren't that but it's, it's each to their own it's a personal preference and I think it's just it's a way more pleasurable driving experience to drive something rear wheel drive than, than front. Uh, I've had 100 mile an hour out of this thing as it stands. Never again is definitely how I'd uh, approach that subject. It was like, yeah, I was coming home from a friend's late one night and I was in Mexico or wherever you want to be. Um, and I thought, oh, it's quiet. I'll see what it can do. And it, it kept going, to be fair. Like, I think it would have gone faster, but I definitely, definitely chickened out. So I was like, they are built like tanks, but if I hit something in this, I'm gonna kill everything in front of me and probably myself. So uh, yeah, it does. It's only got the um, four speed manual with no overdrive. So the only problem with it now is like, when you are sat at motorway speeds, that's the only thing that lets it down really is, it's like quite high in the RPMs, so A, it gets through fuel like nobody's business and it, I don't really like it, the idea of it like, it'll sit at 80 mile an hour but it's at like 4,000 RPM and I just think it's a bit, I feel like I'm beating it really hard. I uh, went to Volvo to try and get some just, it's little dress up bits really, like I wouldn't buy all genuine parts when there's like OEM plus dealers or whatever you want to call them, aftermarket parts dealers. like. Uh, but little things that you'll see like I wanted to put a Volvo oil filter on it because when you open the bonnet you can see it so why have like a nasty one when you can have a proper the white one with the Volvo uh, brand on it or whatever um, and I went to the local like parts department at a Volvo dealer and uh, I gave them my reg to the person behind the desk as you do and they were like your car's not on the system and I was like yeah it probably predates the system and they're like, oh, have you got your VIN number? And I'm thinking, who the, f who knows the VIN number off the head? So I went back out to the car, opened the bonnet, got the VIN number, gave them that, and that was still no help at all. And then, of course, there was the 100-year-old man in the back of the parts department who knows everything, who just walked out and was like, you want one of them? And that was the right thing. Uh, thankfully, he was there, else I don't think I'd have got anything. But it's not too bad to get hold of parts. Little things are more awkward like it's got the windscreen wipers on the front and they both broke 
and you can't, well, I couldn't find new wiper motors, so I had to buy second hand ones, which is fine, they still work now, but it's like some stuff you're just never gonna get new bits for, you're always looking in second hand, but there's so many people that have um, like stored bits over the years and stuff like I wanted. Uh, one of the front headlights, the glass and the massive, so I'm terrified that they're going to get smashed at some point. So I bought some spare ones of those from a guy because he just had a load kicking about, as you do. Um, so it's, it's little things like that, that there, there will be somebody out there that's got spares, but it's just finding that person, if you like. <laughs> um, some people, it's, a, it's Marmite, it's a big time Marmite car. Some people love it just because they're like, oh, it's you know boxy and cool and a bit different and you don't see them all the time and stuff like that and you don't see them all the time because nobody really cared that there was they were just such a throwaway car it was like oh a volvo so everybody had them they did the job that they needed to do and then they chucked them in the bin because what else do you do with something when it's done the job and that's it but now there's like now more than ever i feel like there's a a bigger group of people that are getting more and more passionate and more and more excited about these sorts of cars because they are good fun at the end of the day they are a bit different they do kind of look cool they're a bit out there and the other thing as well is like if you want to get into cars and into they're not difficult to work on and um, like I said you can still get service parts and a lot of mechanical parts for them and they're kind of cool and they're not extortionate like it's not stupid money you can still pick up a rear wheel drive volvo for less than a thousand pounds it won't be in the best condition ever but you can still get one 